Listen to the AZ, AZ Wildcats podcast brought to you by DraftKings, America's number one sportsbook app. Fear not, John Schuster is getting something funny right now. He will be there in just a second. In the meantime, it is myself and Ben White. I already got comments coming in. Arizona destroys Oregon State. Um, nobody likes Beaver this time of uh, this time of the year. Arizona destroys Oregon, Ben, and this was pretty much a performance across the board for the Wildcats. Arizona very good, Oregon State very bad. How about that? I mean, that's pretty much I mean, that's pretty much the way you can get it. And you know, you look at it and you look at it, Julius Tabellis is uh, you know, has his normal almost 20 and 10. John Schuster coming in here with something very, very cool, which we're excited to see as well. But uh Shu, we're just talking about the opening right here. Uh pugs and hugs, bear down five two oh. Appreciate you all back in the back in the A already. But Shu. It's kind of the age old adage that, you know, in the, or in the, if you're playing a team that is uh, much worse than you, you need to go out there and you need to destroy them. And this game was a game that was over very, very quickly. And um, Arizona did what they needed to do. And if some, as someone who knows a lot about age, I'm uh, more than familiar with old age adages in addition, in addition to the ones that are age old. Uh, this is, we mentioned this kind of in passing toward the end of the broadcast. I think, uh, during our DraftKings Pick of the Week segment, uh, Ben mentioned that he was uh, going to take uh, Arizona and whatever the points were. And in the course of that conversation, part of the discussion came up that, uh, you know, even when Arizona uh, went through a little bit of a pocket that wasn't, uh, you know, it was a little bit frustrating. Against teams that just don't match up particularly well with them, Arizona was pretty dominant. And uh, the Oregon State game was the, – the, the, this was an excellent example of, uh, I think, what should have happened and what was to be expected. Uh, and, and Arizona did a very good job taking care of business, and it allowed them in the second half to play players we haven't seen in quite some time. So – not that it's one of those things necessarily where you're terribly worried about the minutes that your starters have, but if you don't need to play them at the same point and, and you have an opportunity to give uh, your bench a lot of minutes uh, throughout the course of a matchup, no reason not to take advantage of it. So uh, another good performance for Arizona against a very overmatched opponent. And as you noted, Mike, Arizona did what it was supposed to do. Oregon yeah, I mean, State think... stinks, by the way. Go ahead, Ben. Sorry. Yeah, they, they, they really do. And I think Going into this game, and you know, we've followed Oregon State from time to time this year. Now, obviously, Arizona's played them before, but if they were going to have even remotely close to a little bit of a chance in this game, they were going to have to make some threes. I believe they were like 18% from three in the first half. Now, granted, they did that up to 33 uh, for the for the final score here, but Oregon State was just not able to make any shots. I mean, they were getting some pretty good looks in the and to start the game, but when you don't have the shooting ability and then really what you don't have, and this is the problem and the lingering theme of the night, is when you really don't have any size, that's where you're in trouble against teams like Arizona. Obviously, Arizona was able to throw whoever they wanted out there in the second half. It was kind of like the red-blue game, um, just seeing all these guys out there. And then to hit on the the bench point too, right? I mean, it was nice to see, I think, somebody like Larson, who I know we're going to talk a lot about, get 23 minutes and 10 points tonight. Somebody like Boswell comes in, hits a really key three, hits a number of key shots, does some good things on the defensive side. He had 22 minutes, so a really well-balanced effort. And obviously uh, – a smoke out uh, on Arizona's end, but they did exactly what they were supposed to do. And it was really the first game in, in quite a while. I think when you're watching Arizona, at least the last month, two or so where you can really kind of take one eye off the screen, because even when Arizona was only leading by 10 in the first half, 
you knew that this game was going to get ugly and it was going to get ugly quick, especially with the fact that Oregon State just wasn't able to make any shots tonight. And I think that was really what hurt them ultimately. I've never been more excited for a, normally I wait till about the 10 minute mark, but I'm going to get the four peaks read in right now because the four peaks all played today and we're going to talk about it. The four peaks. Okay. It's the official brew of PHNX Sports. Check it out at the downtown or the Tempe location. Or if you're cooler and you're in Tucson, come get it at the Tap and Bottle Watch Parties. But again, Four Peaks, Dylan Anderson, Henry Vasar in there making business that uh, or making moves that uh, we were all proud of. Check the show notes and the link in the description. And more furniture, morfurniture.com. You might look at us and say, Mike, what are you sitting on this whole time? It could be something from more furniture. I'm incredibly comfortable right now. Ben White's got a great, great looking office seat right there. Could be something from more furniture. We oh, all man. have a, uh, we've all got something uh, new there. And check it out again. Uh, John Schuster, not from more furniture, but that's only because he hasn't been up to Phoenix to get to more furniture, morfurniture.com. All right. Now let's talk about the bench play. We're going to go uh, opposite here. Kylan Boswell, again, I think we know by this point in the season that he's going to be a player for the cats. Um, and he's already, you know, he's already somewhat of a, of a, you know, a difference maker out there, but between, Kind of his tough nose play on defense and the fact that he can uh, – oh, ASU only down two. Um, all right, keep us up to date, Sci-Fi or Sci-Guy 06. Thank you. Um, but, you know, right now, um, Kylan Boswell, you know what you're getting. But Adama Ball, our guy, um, right now, John Schuster has been talking about how we'd like to see a little bit more Adama Ball. I would like to see more Adama Ball. Gets eight points. And you know what? He looked pretty fluid in the process there, fellas. That's the aspect that I think is probably, you know, feels the best. There's clearly a reason why Ball hasn't been on the floor for most of this season. And I'll I'll admit, I thought, yeah, I thought he was going to be Arizona's difference maker this year. A guy who played a position that they don't did, didn't really have, you know, a true wing per se. I like I like how he sees the floor. I like how he can hit the three. I like his length. Um, but it hasn't happened. And, you know, you could see some games a month or so ago when he was trying to get some minutes here and there and he looked confused and wasn't helping the team. And shortly thereafter, you know, Arizona went to a seven man bench anyway, which has been obviously very effective. But ball looked much more comfortable, very good tonight. And you can see the future if he decides to stay in the program. Uh, and because uh, he's the, not a stiff, I mean, I don't want to interrupt her. I'm no. sorry, but I'm about to. Um, he's not a stiff at all. I mean, you watch him out there, it's not like you're looking at him and you're like, because we've seen players here at the U of A where you're like, you know, eh, I don't know, probably a little bit out of their element right here, probably never going to be a contributor. I've never once gotten that sense by watching a dollar ball out there. I look at a guy and I think yeah. he's somewhat raw, but I've never looked at him, shoe, and said, Man, this this level of play is way beyond what he can ever get to. Yeah, he's smooth. He's fluid. I think he can find a he, he can certainly find a place. Uh, one of the things that I think was a good was good news basically for Arizona in the second half, and it'll probably be a recurring theme here in the course of conversation tonight, is that you basically saw glimpses of a potential future that isn't bad. Uh, you know, you don't know who's going to come back or what the you know, makeup of the team is going to be from year to year in college basketball anymore. But you can make a very good case that Boswell can be an important player in this program for the next year or two. Uh, Ball looked very good, like a guy who, if he garners a little confidence and can figure out some other things, can be very instrumental in what it is that Arizona has not in 22 and 23, but in 23 and 24. And, uh, you know, we'll see how things play out from there. So, it was good from that perspective to get a lot of playing time. And any time that that happens, uh, that's the t one. Obviously, you want a game pretty convincingly. The other option is that you got blown out. And, uh, you know, then you're worried about whether anybody's talented enough. Clearly, Arizona doesn't have that problem here. So it was uh, Ball was a guy who stood out a little bit tonight. And uh, it, it was nice to see. Uh, and during the television broadcast, uh, Matt Muehlbach mentioned a couple of times that he thought Ball was a guy who might play a key element here and there in some difficult game that Arizona has to deal with, perhaps if there's adversity somewhere in that uh, lockdown uh, group of seven right. that the yeah. Cats bring to the equation. And if you have performances like this, if you can 
you know, continue to take baby steps and get a little bit better and better. I think there are things that we saw tonight from a bench standpoint where if you need to throw somebody in a, de in a desperate situation for a couple minutes or so, maybe they can hold their own. Yeah, Ball's definitely going to be one of those guys. If, if he sticks around, whether it's this year or whether it's a year or two from now, he's going to have a place in this program. And I think we talk about, uh, you know, terminology I like to throw out there, kind of the Tommy Lloyd matrix, right? You know, with all these oh, players. Oh, I like that. I like that, Ben. That's all good. The, all these players and guards that somehow year after year kind of take that next step, kind of level up that player development aspect that really makes Lloyd the coach he is. And I think when you look at somebody like Ball, she's absolutely right. There's plenty of room to improve. Um, obviously, there's an opportunity with only seven guys or so that you play regularly. If, God forbid, there's an injury, if there's a, a situation where we've got to have somebody out there different, he can be that guy. And I think between him, Boswell, and, and Henderson, you know, it kind of gives you a glimpse as to what Arizona's future could look like. And it kind of shows you, too, that – Arizona has guys. Arizona has, you know, seven, eight, nine guys if they need to really go there. And I think when you look at some of these top programs across college basketball, depth isn't always the easiest thing to to kind of have under your belt. But Arizona, you know, they don't legitimately obviously go nine or ten deep, but they do show glimpses where in situations, if you need to put somebody out there who doesn't have the most experience, they can go out there and, and fit in okay and contribute. And that's exactly what uh, he did tonight. Yeah. What I like too about the peaks is that the one that you look at both, although they're kind of a little bit like a Dama ball and that you watch both of them and they don't look out of their element at all. That's why I kind of wonder if Tommy Lloyd was thinking to himself, you know, let's let these guys. And again, this is Oregon state. This is a very good, uh, it's a very good point. Uh, very good point. I get it. Um, but you do kind of wonder if, you know, he was saying, let's let these guys take a little bit of a break right here, sit them for a couple games, see what they're watching out there. Because I thought everybody acquitted themselves pretty well. And again, Oregon State sucks. I get all of that. But I was, this to me was a very productive win, though, for the Cats, just because I think it got some guys some confidence. And as everybody knows in basketball, confidence is everything. If you don't have confidence, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And Arizona right now, I think, was able to get some of that from some guys because, again, how many times have we seen a team with a seven-man rotation not have to rely on somebody at some point? I mean, heck, we can talk the national title game, you know, back in 97. Donnell Harris had to, you know, step in there and uh, even though he had been playing and make some big uh, big plays. It's hard, guys, to be able to just do that with seven players. And this, to me, was a little bit, uh, little bit different. The phrase next man up is ridiculous coach speak. Uh, there's a reason why you're not the next man up, because if you were the next man up, you'd be a starter. You're, and, and, and so Arizona's group, you know, there's a, there's a clear delineation between the first seven and the other 32 players who are on that bench. By the way, I swear Arizona, the, the, the personnel around this team, whether it's in the coaching staff or the training staff, the administration aspect or players on the bench, I swear they take up an entire section of McCain. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> like, the support uh, staff is very supporting. It, 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 and and voluminous. Uh, voluminous. So take that for what it's worth. But man, there are a lot of people involved in Arizona basketball. Uh, yeah. But the seven that you see on the floor are clearly critical for Arizona's success. And, and, and over the last three weeks, we get it. You know, they've shortened the bench. It's been effective. Vasar's gotten less minutes. Arizona has sometimes played with a smaller, more traditional lineup. It's been very effective. Uh, and, and and so it's one of those things where there's a reason that Vasar doesn't play more minutes, and there's a reason that Ball doesn't play more minutes, and there's a reason that the rest of the bench doesn't play more minutes. They're not as good as the other seven to get this team to where it wants to be. However... You hope that in matchups like this, where you have an opportunity to get some players on the floor, that uh, if you've got to go to somebody and and it's and it's a player who you're comfortable enough with or or hopefully has enough confidence where they can tread water well enough to give you an opportunity to weather whatever storm there is. It'll be hope. Hopefully this is not a problem we need to see that Arizona will be healthy with seven players heading into the NCAA tournament. If they are. You know, you're going to see a lot of games where Arizona plays seven guys. Uh, this is this is an outlier performance, but in an outlier, you liked what you saw. Perhaps that's going to play a role at some point this year. 
it's probably going to play more of a role in the future. Right. And Ben, now let's move to the starting lineup here a little bit, because obviously there were some good things that we saw from the starters as well. Schuster word of the day, voluminous. Schuster actually, there's a few uh, phrases that Schuster is very, Schuster loves using the word voluminous. I like it too. I never used it before I met Schuster. I try to incorporate it when I can. Schuster, uh, he likes using that. And I would suggest are generally two of his <laughs> most uh Favorite phrase is I have term been, shoes term is I would suggest and your term is I would advise. Yeah, you know what? I would advise that he would suggest. I'll put it to you like that. Um, but let's let's move to the start. Well, actually, let's stay on the bench here for a second. The Swedish pinball, Pella Larson, 33 made free throws in a row. Got to give the man a lot of credit right there. He's he has been beaten up a lot. That's a pretty impressive streak, and he's closing in on Salim Stoudemire's uh, record right there. And so, you know, for some of the weird stuff that he does, he has played magnificently since there's been this lineup switch. My bad, Pella, Ben White. Yeah, it's amazing when you think about the Salim thing. But yeah, I mean, when you're out there in the second half, you know, we're two thirds of the way through conference season and Pella Larkson is sprinting the the court on a breakaway dunk. You know, you have good problems to have. I mean, he's somebody who we've talked about a lot this season as to somebody who we want to see more out of. And he's a guy who... You know, from a shooting perspective, when he's hitting, he's hitting, but he's getting a little bit more uh, confident in the sense that it's a little bit scary at times watching, but he'll put the ball down. He'll try to go to the rim and he'll make things happen. Ten points tonight, three for six from the field. And then, like you said, the free throws is, is really where his kryptonite is, the ability to get to the line, draw contact, and uh, again, just – Another guy, a part of that matrix on the on the bench that uh, Lloyd likes to throw out there. So our bad Pella, not my bad Pella. It's our bad Pella now, I guess. Now, speaking of something that's not our bad, have I told you guys about the DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX? Holy cow, this came out of left field. I have never in the history of my voluminous existence heard about the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Tell me more. Right. Have you heard about the DraftKings Sportsbook app? Not only have I never heard of the DraftKings Sportsbook app, I've never heard of the PHNX. Please tell me. Oh, okay. Here's the deal. You never heard of PHNX either. Here's the deal. You can put down five bucks and get up to $150 in free plays. Got to be 21 and up, Arizona only. Now, uh, check out the show notes and the link in the description. If you think to yourself, man, these guys are idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to bet against them. John Schuster has a Supersonics pennant right there. It, uh, the, wow, you uh, can see that? I yeah. can see it. Oh, see. Okay, here you we might go. Here's your Seattle Seattle Supersonics. The Supersonics now. Okay. They're the Thunder. Yeah, uh, my apologies for that one. I couldn't find the Detroit Pistons one. I'll look for uh, next time. I think they're playing Cal, so I feel reasonably confident we, we, we could have dead time on that show, too. Uh, here's the Kansas City Kings. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Kansas so what's your City advice? Kings. Bet against the Kings or bet yeah, for bet the against, Kings? Yeah, bet against the Kansas City Kings. And definitely don't take a futures bet on the Seattle Supersonics. All right. And – if you might think to yourself, where can I actually go and talk about this? Great question. I have the answer. The Tap and Bottle Watch Parties, February 11th. We'll see you down there. We'd love to see you. Um, we're going to be down there. A lot of great stuff. A lot of people here the comment have come there, and it's been a great time. It's been a blast. We'd love to see you down there. Okay. Now, um, let's now let's move into the starting lineup here a little bit. Schuster made a – and it, I always hate when somebody says this because it's generally about me when somebody says, actually, that's a good point, as if like the default is that you're an idiot, and I wouldn't expect that. But Schuster didn't actually make a good point. He made a good point. That you watch this uh, the synergy between Kirk Kreese and Azulis Tabellis, and it really is next level. There was a play in the second half where I thought of you immediately, where Kreese, um, where Tabellis rolled to the hoop. Uh, Crease had made a really nifty bounce pass. They have a pretty good, um, they have a pretty good idea where each other are going to be at all times. And look at Ben White getting some kudos right here. Just wanted to go ahead right there. Go ahead, shoot John Schuster. You're up. Uh, yes, uh, their two man game is very good. Uh, <laughs> You can quote me on that incredible professional analysis right there. It was, it was. They Stop are, uh, and, and it is, uh, it, it is, you can, it is impressive when you see players who know where it is they're supposed to be. And it's not necessarily something that's been completely manufactured and you don't necessarily understand why that connection is there, but it is. 
and Carissa and Tabellus have done an excellent job now for a lot of understanding how the other is going to perform, where they're going to be, and what their strengths are. Carissa's ability to get Tabellus the ball on a number of places on the block is is one of the major reasons, clearly, that he's leading the conference in assists. And and uh, for to, from Tabellus' standpoint, he knows that a guy like Crease is not going to have a problem getting him the ball. Right. And, and and as a result, that 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 tandem works very well together, and it causes a lot of problems. You can see Arizona going to a two-man game on a lot of their offensive sets, and then conceivably from there, perhaps finding some other guys open. But if you have those kinds of weapons on the offensive end, you can obviously do some good things. Yeah, I think um, that's obviously been the the pinpoint of, of most of their offense throughout the year. But I really think over the last couple of months, that's been the premier focus. I mean, I think the best way to describe it, right, is Tubelis is the engine and uh, Kreese is the conductor, right? They know exactly where they're going like to be. That. They make the train flow. Justin, so. That's good. Yeah, there you go. So I think Kreese is one of those guys. And not only Tubelis, there was a play, I think, end of first half, early second half, Muehlbach pointed it out where it was kind of a behind-the-back bounce pack pass to, uh, I think, Boswell in the right corner for a three, and the Pat Mahomes analogy was thrown out there. So he's got spectacular court vision. I mean, if it's not two bells, it's Ballo inside. If it's not those guys, it's one of the guards. So he's a fluid guy. He's He is the definition of consistency when it comes to distributing the ball. Um, and obviously, like you said, it shows with leading the conference and assist. And he's a guy who's going to make you shots. And I think that's the difference when you look at somebody like him compared to other gar- guards that Arizona has is he's enough of a threat offensively and can definitely be a guy who goes off for 20 plus points in a in a game. So you have to worry about what he's going to do behind the arc as well. So um, he's as consistent as they get. And he is definitely a, a problem for for teams. Basil of Caesarea. First of all, <laughs> sounds like something from uh, the Old Testament, maybe Leviticus around the, uh, you know, maybe the um, the Dead Sea Scroll era. Great name, by the way. But I agree with him. Hey, guys, is the Pac-12 better than people think? Yes, I've thought that from day one. You look at it out of conference, the Pac-12 had the most top 25 wins, the most quad wins or whatever you want to call it. And Arizona and UCLA are both top 10 teams. Then USC is USC's a tournament team. Um, and you know, there's other teams in there, obviously Oregon's hit or miss, but they can beat anybody on a given day. ASU somewhat of the same way, but I think the conference is better. And I think if that you were to put them, uh, in the big 10, there would be nine teams getting into the, uh, NCAA tournament. I mean, joking aside though, this conference isn't nearly as bad as I think a lot of people think it is, John Schuster. And, and, and I think part of the, that, 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 that kind of plays into a point with tonight's game. Uh, Arizona w- would like to be in a position where it was able to play bench players a lot more junk minutes. But they haven't had a lot of games in, this, in, in conference play where they've been able to do that. Uh, they've had some impressive Ws over the course of the last couple of weeks. Uh, if uh, A lot of people called it their revenge tour where they had the two Washington schools in Oregon and played – you know, very well. But generally speaking, the Cats have been in a number of very competitive games. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, the quality of team that they're playing. I think if, you know, I don't know how many teams the Big Ten is going to get uh, in, into the NCAA tournament, whether it's, you know, let's say it's too many. Rumor is 19. Too many. <laughs> uh, and rumor is 19. Okay, let's go with let, let's go with eight for sake of argument. I think if you took... Keep it going, Cy Guy, by the way. Thank you. Go ahead, Shoe, sorry. Uh, I, I think if you took team four through eight in both of those conferences as an opponent, I'd be significantly more concerned playing a Pac X team in that slot than I would be a Big Ten team in that slot. I think and 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 I get that it's tough. The Mountain West is an example of a team that goes through this too. And I I I understand I understand the argument and the predisposed bias that goes into this you have to have it's easy to think that something is trendy in the year and then they get into the tournament and they let you down the pack x has had a bunch of seasons where they haven't been particularly impressive in the ncaa tournament the mountain west every once in a while they talk about oh look at those three teams they're dark horses in the mountain west and they never get out of the first weekend uh, so i get that there's in addition to the time zone issue that there's a hedging based on history. But if you look, Mike, and Mike, the, 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 the fact of what you talked about 
is the baffling part of this equation that the Pac X had more quality wins out of conference than right. any other conference. So if that's a metric, then why wouldn't this conference be better respected on a national scope? Uh, and because and it doesn't I, go ahead, sorry. And, and 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 if you eye test them, Oregon's tournament a tournament quality team. SC right. is a tournament quality team. ASU is a tournament quality team. And I know their record isn't very good. So clearly they they haven't done enough to get in. I think Washington State's an NCAA tournament quality team. And Washington even has the kinds of athletes that give you problems. If Utah gets healthy again, Utah's a problem. So you're going to have, what, four of those teams that maybe don't make the NCAA tournament who I wouldn't want to see them if I was in my bracket in an opening round matchup. Uh, uh, and that's right. This is a Sorry. great point. Yeah. Basil of Caesarea makes another great point. Sci guy, by the way, you did God's work right there. ASU lost. Thank you, man. Good work. Back the Eddie. Um, Basil of Caesarea says, case in point, Arizona and Colorado beat Tennessee and USC lost to them in overtime. And Tennessee is still ranked number two. However, they punish Arizona when they lose to a PAC 12 team, similar to Colorado. That is exactly what it is. And that's why we encourage people to uh, contribute here because you're smarter than me. You put it more succinctly than I ever could. That's that's exactly in a nutshell. That's what I think. I think what just drives me up a wall right here is that there's you know it's like after the Washington State game, it's I mean or excuse me the uh, the Utah game. Turns out Utah doesn't totally stink, and they're like, well, you know, I mean Arizona lost. They got blown out by Utah. Can you really take them seriously? Meanwhile, if anybody else loses, it's well, that's college basketball. That's the gauntlet. That's the way that it's going through all the crap cliches that you know we're generally uh, we're used to hearing but i do i think that this is a pretty good conference i mean all things considered it's not the big 12 but i'll generally put it against maybe you know i'll, I'll put it against the big 10 all day of the week but mike uh, i think one of the things that's fascinating here you talked about this on a show i think it was when arizona played ucla somewhere in that window where i think jay billis was here at that game and you took umbrage is another word for you. Yes. Um, with what Jay Billis said in regards to two pack X teams, uh, uh, cannot be on the top line, cannot both be number one seeds in the NCAA tournament. I think you rightly said, well, why the hell not? Right. Uh, and there's going to be a bias that goes into this that may pinch one of those teams down. What happened, for instance, let's say Arizona runs the table up until the uh, LA uh, weekend. Right. Which is, very have to think, yeah. which is a real possibility. If that were to happen, it's hard for me to fathom that regardless of what happens from that point on, that Arizona's not hasn't done enough to be a number one seed in the tournament. Yet UCLA may have a better conference record than they do. Right. So why hasn't UCLA done enough to be a number one seed? The problem here is going to be that someone's going to be in love with the ACC or someone's going to be in love with Purdue in the Big Ten. And, and you have to put a Big 12 team there, understandably, because that, there, there, there's some really good basketball that's played there. But the, the, the Pack x might be pinched out from the top line, even though you have two teams that have resumes that belong in that conversation. Well, and let's talk about Arizona's schedule going forward here, because here's where it gets interesting. By the way, TRQ3, no room for Wazoo and the other Pac-X teams when all of the Big Ten needs a spot. <laughs> the Pac-X is definitely taking off right here. It's a fair point. Uh, you know, It really is a fair. Yeah, yeah, you do have to keep slots available for the Big Ten. I mean, you've got to have the 12 team. spots available for the Big Ten. Absolutely. But here's Arizona's schedule. Great point. Ben, here's Arizona's schedule going forward. I mean, I could be totally wrong. Wilson Breckenbridge, another fantastic name. Appreciate you, my guy. Back the A. It's awesome. Um, Zona Tucson, back the A. Great game. Rooting for Adama Ball. Awesome. Um, here's Arizona's games coming up here now. You've got Arizona, California. Uh, California's terrible. They should be able to beat California. Arizona, Stanford. Um, by the way, that's February 11th. The Tap and Bottle Watch Party will see you up there downtown. Then you got the uh, Mountain Schools at home. Arizona probably should win all four of those games right now. And Arizona's already ranked fifth in the nation. At that point, I think that you need to... Uh, I don't know. I, I think at that point, you're looking pretty solid at a number one seed right there, fellas. Yeah, considering the Mountain Schools are at home, I think not only should Arizona win all of those games, but they should win them pretty convincingly. And then you get to the point where you go to L.A. and it's kind of up in the air right now. I don't think 
Arizona is expected to win at Poly against UCLA. I mean, it could go either way. Arizona could definitely, definitely win. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying, but if you win all of those games and do what you're supposed to do in my mind, take out the bias, take out the feelings towards the big 10, the ACC, whatever you want to do black and white on paper, Arizona should be a number one seat. I mean, there's no yeah. getting around it. Uh, Purdue lost to IU today pretty significantly, but we're not hearing so much about that. I mean, just as a, a convenient example. So, and you look across, I mean, the AP top 25, I know that's not end all be all for obviously March Madness seating, but there's only two teams in the big 10 in the top 25 right now. It's not like we have five to six, just killer top 15 teams. So I, I think you're exactly right. I think Arizona is going to run the table. I think that, they're expected to win and they're expected to beat these teams pretty convincingly. And then at that point you get to the USC game, you get to the UCLA game. I'm not too concerned about the USC game to be quite honest, but I think UCLA, it could go either way. And at that point you have to see how the committee treats them. And then it opens up the conversation, which I'm sure we'll get a little bit more into as to how much does that PAC 12 tournament truly mean for Arizona? Do they have that one seed locked down or is there going to be a bit more to play come uh, March in Vegas when we're up there? That's a great question. Uh, Shu, I think that if Arizona were to win out, and again, I realize that there's a lot of basketball still to be played. you got those four crummy schools, but then you've got the L.A. schools and you've got ASU. Those three teams can – they can cause some problems, but I, I would have a hard time believing that if Arizona goes into the PAC 12 tournament at what third or 28 and three or whatever, whatever it would be. I don't have the math right in front of me that you're not in a very, very solid position for a number one seed regardless, or as our good friend, Kevin Woodman would say, irregardless of where you're, um, of what happens in the Pac-12 tournament, just based off your record and the wins that you would already have. You would have UCLA, you'd have Tennessee, you'd have Indiana, you would have San Diego State, you'd have Creighton. Creighton, by the way, is 11 in Ken Palm. So that's coming back around. I would have a hard time believing that Arizona wouldn't have a fairly good lock on a number one seed. If it lays out the way that you just presented and Arizona wins at UCLA, Arizona's a number one seed, regardless of what happens at the PAC-X tournament. Yeah. The question becomes, the more likely scenario, if Arizona loses at Poly, and then if you're in a PAC-X tournament final with Arizona and UCLA, is that game not just for the tournament champion, but is that game for a number one seed? Right. And then it becomes because, like we said, Jay Billis has already indicated to us that no matter what it is, you can't have two teams from the Pac 12. That's ridiculous. By the way, um, uh, Psy Guy going to my first Pac 12 tournament this year, pretty excited. We have all been there before, or at least uh, we've been there before. It is a fantastic time. You'll have to come visit us. Uh, ben and I will be there on remote. Schuster, hopefully, will be chipping in from Henderson, Nevada. We're still working all of that out right there, but it's a great time. Love to see you up there. Uh, as a matter of fact, every post game, Brian Jeffries made his way up there uh, towards the end. So always fun to talk with the goat. Um, now, I wanted to get back to a little bit about the guard play here for Arizona. But first, let's just say that you heard that uh, that that Bay Area road trip and you're thinking to yourself, Cal and Stanford, hmm, where would I find tickets for that? Great point. Great question. We're here with answers. Game time. The best ticketing app out there. You can go there and you can get 60% off many times. And uh, check out the show notes and the link in the description. We've had many people here that have utilized it as well. And they've come on and they have they have uh, shouted the voluminous different uh, ways that this uh, the game time helps you out. Check it out. It was a really weak attempt at uh, incorporating voluminous in there, but it still worked right there. Um, and so, and Mountain Mike's Pizza. John Schuster has been to Mount Mike's Pizza. I have been to Mount Mike's Pizza. Ben White informed us that he uh, Mount Mike's Pizza is in California. Check it out. Oracle and Wetmore. You don't need to go to California to eat their pizza. You can go to Oracle and Wetmore. Uh, great TV setup. Great drinks. Great food. Check it out. Mount you, Mike's you Pizza. Can go, you, you can sorry, go. I'm sorry, Ben. Your, Go, go ahead. ahead. You, can go, you can go get your pizza, and then you can open up that game time app and figure out what uh, Laker Ooh, game you want to go to. Look at that. But unfortunately, our friends from Lithuania who are watching on the broadcast cannot go to Mountain Mike's Pizza. We, we Are we sure that, that, that there's not a Mountain Mike's Pizza in Lithuania? Are we, are we sure there's not like a frozen version of pizza we can, <laughs> they can order uh, or something? We could hope for the best, and we could do whatever we can. 
Okay, but let's talk about the guards now a little bit. This I noticed this a little bit, and maybe it was just me, uh, but it seems that Courtney Ramey is kind of settling into a nice little role. What I liked what I saw about Courtney Ramey today is he's more talented than just being a standstill shooter. Yeah. I mean, you watch him. There's times when he drives to the basket, when he's got some floaters, when he can get by his guy. I like when Courtney Ramey is more in attack mode. And sure, I mean, you only had 11 points. I get it. But there were multiple times when he got to the basket where I thought that, you know, he was he was exerting some pressure on the defense that in years or in games past he hadn't done. One of the things that I think is fascinating is that in the in the change in lineup, the consolidation of Arizona's lineup and playing time, generally speaking, today obviously accepted, uh, is that when we have the conversations over the course of the last couple of weeks where Arizona has played much better basketball, usually it goes something like this. Player one was good. Player two was good. Player three was good. Player four was good. By the way, player five was good. And so was player six and player seven. Every player in that roster who gets playing time has done very well since Arizona has consolidated that group. Ramey has been significantly better. Creesa looks comfortable. Obviously, Tabellus knows what it is he, what he wants to do, and he's a problem. Uh, the, I think the Ballo, Ballo's health, I think, is still undervalued. And even though Arizona has successfully played with a smaller lineup when he isn't in the game, his ability to complement what it is that Tabellus does remains a big deal. Uh, and, and, and so he's done a good job. The, the, the good news here for Arizona is that at the top of that roster, you have a separation of seven guys who are getting legitimate playing time who are chipping in consistently uh, on a game-to-game -game basis. And when that happens, it gives Arizona the kind of versatility that you'd like to see. And they've obviously put together very good basketball games. Benjamin? Yeah, I think um, I think to kind of piggy off that, I think somebody like Ramey, you know, I've been saying for the last month or so, it doesn't always show on the the scoring uh, scoring box, but when you look at the guard play on the bench and those guys, you know, kind of sneaking into that starting lineup, right? The guys outside of Crease, uh, he to me has been the most consistent, and I think he's obviously not only the most consistent in terms of what he does out there when he's in the game, but he's the most versatile. I mean, today he forced a couple of steals. He was able to be aggressive near the basket. I think. He had, um, yeah, he had six rebounds. I mean, so uh, there's a number of different things he can do. Um, he obviously is a great shooter, like you've talked about, Mike, but I think he's kind of come to the point in the year where he's discovering that he can do a lot more. And he's one of the reasons, if not the biggest reason, I think that Arizona has been able to tighten up that seven man rotation and we kind of find ourselves in the spot that we are now. So something has definitely clicked with him over the last month. And we talked about back in October, you know, back in November, December, there was something missing with one of these guards who was going to step up. And Ramey has obviously been that guy. And to me, it's not even close. By Side way, guy, you mentioned 90 oh, lives in here. We had 107 earlier. We're at 95 now. Tell those 12 people to come back. We missed them. <laughs> John Schuster, you're up. Uh, one of the two things, and Matt Muehlbach talked about this on the television broadcast tonight, and I think it's uh, uh, poignant. There's another one for you. Uh, that two things have taken place with Arizona basketball that ha that this year that recently has made them better and this goes a long way toward a, a compliment we're complimenting players the coaching staff deserves immense kudos for showing a willingness to try to tweak some things this late into the season and not being stubbornly locked into yes. an approach that they think works for them Arizona has gone to a seven-man rotation and taken Vasar out of that group, which doesn't always make them two bigs. Go right. And it's easy to understand the logic of that. The logic is that Arizona's got two big starters who cause problems on the inside, who both are offensive threats, and both can be 20 and 10 guys, pretty consistent. Not a lot of teams in the NCAA have that. So if so, then if Arizona's advantage is big guys. When you go to the bench, go to another big guy and see if he can contribute and try to continue to play to that advantage. Arizona went in another direction. And Arizona went more traditional when Ballo isn't in the game. And that is something that has been effective. Now, it hasn't been as effective from a rebounding standpoint, 
uh, with Ballo and w- w- with the bigger lineup in Arizona was averaging. I heard Ryan Hansen talking about this on the radio tonight. Uh, some, 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 something like ten rebound advantage a game. Maybe, maybe it was eight. Uh, and since Vasar has been out of the lineup a little bit more and they've gone smaller, it's been closer to three and a half or four. So the rebounding number has gone down a little bit. But Arizona's ability to disrupt defensively and get well-rounded scoring has certainly made up the difference on that front. That's that's one thing that the coaching staff changed two thirds of the way through the season, right? To try to jumpstart something, and and it's been effective, and kind of counterintuitive in the process. So so they saw something behind the scenes, or there were a series of conversations where they were where you know they had some open dialogue and came to the conclusion that maybe this is something we ought to look into. It's clearly worked. The second thing, obviously, is making Pella Larson, having Larson come off the bench. Uh, I don't understand. Hey, the three of us in this room have more than our share of OCD stuff. So I guess we get weird OCD, you know, quirks and tweaks and the rest. I have the ladder behind me so I can climb out of my OCD. (laughs) Beautiful. Uh, But so so sometimes something doesn't necessarily make sense with Larson coming off the bench. It does. It just doesn't make sense to me, but it works. Uh, and, and, and he's getting, you know, plenty of minutes. And for whatever reason, the Larson that you hear rumors about in the offseason, who's the best team on this roster, the last three weeks, you've seen right. elements of that. And it's made Arizona so much better. Is it coincidence that he came off the bench? I don't know. Uh, but it's worked. And the willingness to approach those two things uh, has made Arizona better. And it's nice to see a coaching staff that has a willingness to communicate among one another to try to come up with some tweaks, even this late in the game, to see what they can do to improve the product before heading down the home stretch. Cy Guy 06, I got to give you a lot of credit right here. When we put that uh, out there, we're up to 109. So not only did you bring all 12 back, you brought two more into the fold. We appreciate that right there. Um, by the way, M- MP, this is great. He says, unfortunately, no mountain mics in here in Lithuania. Maybe we can convince Mike to expand into a Baltics branch, especially <laughs> as the Wildcats fan base keeps growing. I will talk to the people in sales at PHNX, and we'll see if we can get that one going. All right. I, I'm a guy that I, uh, I, want, I can't go back all the way up here, but there was a question made about Tommy Lloyd. First of all, he's got to be coach of the year again in the conference, No. I mean, you look around. Uh, I don't, I, 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 you can certainly make a very good case for it. I think the guy at Utah is probably overachieved and is going to get a fair amount of love unless the injury up there really sidetracks them down the stretch. Cronin at UCLA might win the conference. Uh, so I think you can make a very good argument for all of those. I'm not, I'm not dissuading the argument on Lloyd at all. Lloyd loses three uh, NBA draft picks and has Arizona knocking on the door of a one or two seed. Uh, so he, what he's done is exceptional, and could he win it back-to-back? Absolutely. I, he, he definitely is in that conversation, but I'm not sure it's a home run it, pick. It just goes to show you, too, how remarkable this job he's been. Now, again, P, uh, voters always have voter fatigue. That's why, you know, Michael Jordan won five MVPs in his career. Probably should have won about eight or nine. Um, but, you know, because people just don't want to keep voting for the same guy again. I can make a very good case that Tommy Lloyd should be national coach of the year again. This yeah. team start. This team started out uh, the year ranked 17, and I think that Schuster and I, you know, I don't know where Ben fell in it, but I, you know, Ben's a wise guy, so I assume that he probably, um, you know, he probably uh, probably agrees with us. That's a pat on the back right there. But um, you know, I didn't view this team as being a team that could get into the top five, the top seven, eight. And they've been hovering around that in the top 10 all season. And right now they're squarely looking at a number one seed when they were projected as a four or a five going into the season. This has been another outstanding job by Tommy Lloyd there, Ben. It has. I mean, I think when we looked at what was coming into this season with what Arizona had left after Terry Coloco and uh, Matherin left, I think you definitely thought that they had some solid players, but at the same time you had a lot of projects and a lot of unknowns and we kind of thought this was going to be that transition year because we've seen it. I mean, under Sean Miller, you know, for the most part up until the last few years when, when everything went down and we don't need to really get into that, but up until then you did a fairly decent job of restocking, but I just think that the player development aspect is just so crucial and so underrated here. 
And it's not to say that these guys weren't expected to get better, but I don't think anybody expected the, the level of players here to get better as quickly as they did. And you know what they say, when you've got no choice and you've got to make something work, you make it work. And I think that's exactly what Arizona, Arizona did. By the way, I know we're not big stats people here, but um, Seth Davis makes an interesting point here when he talks about Arizona's defense. Um, just looking at uh, the rankings on Ken Palm, on January 18th, they were ranked 88th in the country in efficiency. Um, and you know where they are today? Number one, my friends, number one. Wow. Hmm. Really? Wow, that's why we have Ben White in here. And you know what you might be saying to yourself? This Ben White seems very smart. He's a very successful businessman out in California. That's why we would bring Ben on to crunch the numbers in a way that we couldn't crunch. Ben, that's, that's very good. That's an eye-opening number. It um, really is. I'll, I'll, I'll admit to you that there is a portion of concern that I have about those numbers that reflects offensive inconsistency in the conference. Uh, not to suggest that Arizona hasn't improved what are you going to suggest defensively that they have i'm going to suggest that arizona obviously has improved defensively uh however they also play a number of teams in a conference that i don't think are particularly consistent on the offensive end that's fair that's a good and, very good point and, yeah. and and to arizona's credit they've scouted that very well and negated a lot of uh what it is that uh teams have done but part of my concern in the NCAA tournament is that maybe a lot of this is a little bit of more of an illusion than we would like. What is kind of interesting, I think, is that the way Arizona plays defense, it's not as overtly aggressive as what Miller did at Arizona. But this Arizona team looks kind of a lot more like a Miller team. They play a lot more half-court basketball. Obviously, their motion on the offensive end is better. Uh, but they're but but they have to win in the half court, and they've shown, uh, generally speaking, an ability to do that. They obviously any opportunity there is to run, they take it, which is clearly a difference. However, back to your national coach of the year conversation. Interestingly. I think Miller's one of the guys who's in that conversation in yeah. terms in, in terms of teams who have overachieved based on preseason expectations. Xavier is absolutely near the top of that conversation. And the guy at Kansas State, I think, is probably in that uh, mix as well. I think the guy from I, Kansas yeah. State, I think Tang probably ends and up then, winning. He'll probably win it. And yeah. I can see that. And, and, and I wouldn't argue that if it happened. I think pay, Painter is in, at Purdue, as much as we think Purdue isn't going to have much of a tournament run. I fall under that category, by the way. I, I, I think Purdue I is going to be in trouble once they get into the tournament. Uh, paint, clearly, Painter's done a good job at Purdue. Uh, but if if you've got a board in front of you and you're trying to look at uh, pieces and throwing out some names for conversation, Lloyd is certainly one of them. All right, everybody out there, I want to give everybody out there a huge thanks. Worldwide PHNX, you guys are fantastic. Um, again, really appreciate you hopping on from the, uh, uh, you know, from across the uh, Atlantic and everybody on here again. Um, you're the ones that make the show. You come up with a lot of points that I would never even think about. Um, just really appreciate you. Ben is settled in very, very nicely, uh, on here, getting a lot of kudos, Ben, you're the man. Um, John Schuster is always my mentor, my good friend, the person that I enjoy, um, basically bothering to no end, the but everybody the operation. There, yes. The, yes, yes. The head of the operation right there. He's got a little head, but there's a lot packed in there. But <laughs> again, everybody out there really, really appreciate you guys. We will, I'll be back with you uh, tomorrow. We got Lamont Lovett coming on at one o'clock talking a little U of A football. And again, uh, U of A watch party, um, uh, February 11th. We'll be back with you on the post game on Thursday though, for, uh, John, uh, for John Schuster, Ben White, I'm Mike Luke. You've been listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast post game show.